you Hello, all everybody. Well. I'm dreadfully sorry about all of this, but uh, <laughs> we have two problems. The first one is that Wendy is uh, down, not functioning. Eugene is flat on it there. The problem here is smaller and bigger at the same time. We have managed to lose, get rid of, uh, somehow misplace, or um, perhaps have stolen by aliens the immobilizer for this car. This means that Rusty is immobile. Now, although broadcasting with the speed and skill of the Apollo 13 on its way to the moon, unfortunately, it is unable to drive anywhere. We are very sorry about this. Eugene is on that one. We are on this problem, and we will sort it out as soon as we possibly can. Until then, I'm afraid there's not much I can tell you. I would imagine 20 minutes or so we should be with you. Sorry about that. Please accept my humblest apologies, and we will see you a little bit later.
Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us.
Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us.
Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us.
Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us.
Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us.
Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Merciful heavens, everybody, here we are. We have managed to find the immobilizer for Rusty. That, of course, is not Rusty. That is a Nyala, a beautiful bull walking across quarantine clearings. And you can see how green and verdant is our land at the moment after the rain that we've had. Again, my humblest apologies for being a total imbecile and losing this uh, little thing. Let me show you what it was. And I will tell you where I found it. It's this highly important, singular, only. Uh, there's no spare to this. This is the only one we have. And I found it on a game path where Viam and I had been walking this morning. And how it got there can only be explained by my own idiocy, which is in itself inexplicable. So I'm sorry about that, but here it is. We can still go. Wendy is not my fault, though. That really isn't my fault. Anyway, that's the plan. I apologize again for that we are late. Some Nyala there. There's some elephant further down the road, so I think we'll go and have a look at them. Now, remember, if you're wondering what on earth is going on, how you have stumbled across this website, and now there's some fool blethering on at you about having lost an immobilizer. You are on a live safari in the northeast corner of South Africa, Kruger National Park. And of course, uh, these things happen out here in the bush. No spares, no batteries sometimes, and sometimes we lose our minds and our immobilizers. Uh, when that means we'd like you to talk to us, please, because we are live. Uh, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv if you are on the email. The other one is for Twitter. And then on YouTube, just use the YouTube chat stream. That is a very effective way of talking to us. Ask us anything you like, except about the mechanics of this car, of course, which are a mystery uh, more unfathomable than the construction of the Nazca lines in South America. But anything about Africa, South Africa, safaris in general, travel, and uh, perhaps the drought even, which seems to have broken slightly on account of the wonderful green stuff that you can see here next to us. Phew. Here we go. Ah. Tim, an immobilizer, you're in Arkansas and you want to know what an immobilizer is. Well, an immobilizer is a sophisticated piece of equipment that is very useful in the towns of South Africa, where Grand Theft Auto is a national pastime. And what it does is that unless you have that very thing, the car is impossible to start. It is so impossible to start that BMW has reliably informed us that it is impossible to remove the immobilizer system from this car. This is an old BMW engine. What that means is, and of course this car is now, well, it's almost 20 years old. There are no spares for this thing. It cannot be taken out. Its purpose in the bush is, uh, is completely useless. It is like having a uh, water dinghy in the Sahara Desert. Uh, theft, Grand Theft Auto, very unlikely out here. And so its purpose is completely useless out here, but totally impossible to remove. So Tim in Arkansas, that's what an immobilizer is. You probably, I'm sure you have them in the States, you probably just call them something else. Hello, Bill. Bill, you bet that Mama Z found the immobilizer. Mama Z, for everybody who doesn't know, is the wonderful, wonderful woman who I suppose could be described as the matron of the DRC. That's where we live. And the matron of the DRC, Mama Z, did not, in fact, this time, Bill, find it. She finds everything else. But this, unfortunately, was out in the bush, and so I had to go and find it myself, uh, which was um, something of a challenge. Viam didn't have much faith, nor did I. And we were just about to leave the last place where I got out of the car. And I thought, let me just quickly walk down that path. And I said, as I set off down the path, I said, there's no way it's down here. Well, sure was nuts, there it was. Lying on the ground against a little grass tuft, smiling at me. And I'm so pleased to have it back. And I'm now going to staple it to my leg.
Hello, Genevieve. You say that Raisa, who is something of a genius when it comes to the plants on this reserve, sorry, there's an elephant over there, you say that she told you that a carrion plant flowers in March, indeed, and we will try and find you one, Genevieve. I'll look out for it. There's not a lot of rocky areas here, though, so it's, they're not, won't be common, but they will be around. Now, this is another tree beneath which the elephants are feeding of Raisa's, and that is, of course, the sausage tree, which has yet to produce any sausages this year. That elephant is eating a bush willow. And now that we have found some animals, I shall calm myself and speak in a much calmer fashion. There are two elephants there. There's a, there are a whole lot around here. I can hear quite a few. So we'll just sit here and see what unfolds. Here comes another one, a big cow, an enormous cow coming across the drainage line there towards the cow that we're looking at and her baby. There she is. That's a big cow, that. I can hear them all over the place. I think we'll just sit here for a little while and see if they don't all pop through. She she's trying to smell us. You can see she's noticed us, obviously. We smell very strongly of petrol. That's gasoline and brake fluid and clutch fluid and steering fluid and all those other fluids that, again, have incomprehensible functions. And then a little whiff mixed in that with that will be the scent of human, and that is what will disturb the elephants if they get hold of it. And I don't know if you can see, but quite clearly there, the female behind, the big cow who came in last, is dominant over the other one. The other one seems a little bit nervous of her. What let me, I want to do is just reverse back a bit. You might get a slightly better view up the slope. Safari surfer, you say you feel such deep emotion when you see the elephants. Safari surfer, I understand that feeling entirely. I also feel often different, differing emotions when I see elephants. I think depending quite a lot on how they feel. And I always love to hear how you, these sightings do make you feel because sometimes it's difficult to express. So I would very much like, for those of you who would like to, for you to tell us um, how these elephants do make you feel. In one word on Twitter, tell us, just give us one word for how these elephants make you feel. One word only. Hashtag Safari Live questions at wildearth.tv. And don't say elephants in general. Try and get a sense of these current elephants. Try and read their behavior their interactions with each other. There's a very little one there. Try and look at how it's behaving. And then just try and see how you think these elephants perceive us. And then send through one word. Wonderful sounds of them walking gently through the bush and then the odd snap. Hello, dogs mum. Dogs mum, you're in Las Vegas. That's a wonderful Twitter handle, dogs mum. Um, you want to know what happened to Brent today uh, with the elephants that walked past him because, of course, the I think the feed cut basically as they were walking past his vehicle, which probably gave some of you a bit of a fright. And the elephants just carried on walking past him. Brent is uh, currently out on foot tracking, 
And so all of that turned out rather nicely. Here's the little one. Here comes a cow to say hello to us, young cow. She's now about 10 meters from us. That's 33 feet. Louise says that <laughs> it looks to her like they're smiling when they eat like this. It's interesting. I suspect that's probably more an energetic feeling than an actual facial expression, which is quite interesting. Now, David, if you zoom in on that rather large swelling in her belly there, and you see the top under her back, that kind of pale bit. I mean, she's young. She can't be more than eight or nine years old, maybe, maybe ten. Hi. <laughs> she looks pregnant to me, though, which I think is interesting, because she's very young. She's very, very young. But she's definitely, I mean, her mammary glands have swollen, so I think she probably is pregnant. Now, it's not impossible for an elephant to have a baby at around 10 years old. But it is young. And while well, Dave swings back towards us, Kermie, you want to know how you tell the age of an elephant. Kermie, mm, it's difficult. It is t it's largely experience and seeing lots of different ones, different sizes. The most obvious thing, we'll just turn back to this cow here. The most obvious thing, Kermie, to look at for the little ones is if they are very small and under a year old, they'll be able to fit under their mother's bellies. Then at 18 months, the tusks will erupt. So that's easy. After which it becomes a little bit difficult um, to say, unless you see lots of them. I mean, various ways of telling if they're old or young, I suppose, would be the condition of the skin, the size. Of course, a bull never stops growing, nor does a cow. Um, size of tusks is not a good way because they all have different size tusks. It doesn't tend to make a huge difference. Um, you know, it's just kind of a genetic abnormality. Abnormally is not a word. I'm not sure what I want to say, actually. Um, there are a whole lot more calling through here. Just going to wait for this young bull to come up the road before we move. Um, and if we look at this one, at the young bull there, I mean, I know he's young simply from his size. He's probably standing about... maybe about eight or nine feet at the shoulder. Yeah, so difficult to tell unless you've kind of got one in front of you. I'm not going to go down the road. We could get closer to them, but I'm just going to let them kind of wander about us and see how they react. Now, what, one thing I do want you to notice there, we had a question the other day about the knees on an elephant. Now, look there at the what seem to be the knees. They look kind of wet on that elephant. And that is the same joint as your wrist joint. See that? Now, you can immediately see, once I say that, but that is the wrist joint. And watch when this elephant walks again, and I want you to look for the elbow joint, which bends exactly the same way as our elbow joint would if we were on all fours. There it goes. You can see it underneath the shoulder there, and then you can see the shoulder up just behind the ears. So their joints bend in exactly the same way that we do. They're just slightly different lengths. Well, not slightly different lengths. They're vastly different lengths. So, uh, Teresa and Kim, Kimber, you say humble. Oh, there's a tree going down. So you see it, Dave? You see it shaking there in the background there? It's going. Oh, it's gone. So, Catherine, you say happy. 
Astralina, you say content. I think these are all wonderful words for elephants. Certainly this particular herd is making me feel a sense of yeah, happiness. There's something slightly not quite off about them. Heidi, you say soulful, but for me, there's an edge, a slight edge about this herd. I think that there is a little bit of discontent in it. And I can hear them calling through there. They don't have quite the same restfulness about them that they often do. It might just be me struggling to kind of come down after the great excitement of the immobilizer hunt. Jamie Patterson, who's in final control right now, say, says, I think this is a wonderful, wonderful description, says that elephants make her feel grateful. Yes, I think tinged with whatever other emotion I feel around them, I'd say gratefulness is certainly one of those. Thank you, Jamie. If you could kindly get on Wendy and help me out out here, that would be wonderful. Wendy is obviously still down, everyone, if Jamie Andrea Patterson is still in final control. I'm just gonna go back a little bit. No, I'm not, I'm gonna roll forward, actually, because there's more going on in front of us. I didn't even introduce myself, and if you don't know who I am, my name is James Hendry, and on camera today is David. Hello, David. Hello. There's David. There's a young bull in front of us here who's just examining the borehole pump house. Now, Wendy, you want to know if there's some kind of physiological reason for why an elephant is wrinkly. You know, it's not, and like you say, we have laugh lines, of course, but when we're born, we don't. When we're born, we have smooth, Smooth skin, hence the expression, smooth as a baby's bottom. Um, why do they have wrinkly skin? I, th I don't know. I mean, the only thing I can think is to maybe to increase the surface area, and maybe the hotter it is, uh, the more they are able to expand that surface area by, you know, breathing out, or I don't know how they would do it, and that will help them to lose heat and then they can contract it again when they have, when they're cold. I can't really think of any other particular reason why they should need that skin. And of course, the skin gives rise to their sort of, um, it's not a generic term, it's kind of a colloquial term, a pachyderm, which I think means wrinkly skin, if I'm not mistaken. They're all around here. Let's just go a little bit forward and around the corner and have another look there. It's so wonderful to hear the starting engines, isn't it? And these chaps living outside the herd will be young bulls. Let's have a last look at this guy. Hmm. A safari surfer, you want to know about their feet because you've noticed that they walk so sort of comfortably and they look like they've got such soft feet. And they do have soft feet, Safari Surfer, but there's a big callus on the bottom of it, and that callus makes it possible for them to walk over thorny and unpleasant ground. Look at this young bull coming to say hi. This is wonderful. And he's eating a bit of knob thorn, which, of course, while we talk about the feet being soft and able to cope with uh, with uh, thorns and rough ground, that trunk is just astonishing, as is the mouth, which is able to deal with the thorns. Look how close he is now. He's only about, oh, I don't know, probably eight meters, 24 feet. You can even hear his mouth chewing. Listen.
Hello, kitty, kitty, bang, bang. Um, that's a, another fantastic Twitter handle. Look at him. Isn't he wonderful? Kitty, kitty, bang, bang. You want to know if elephants have got two bones in their forearms like we do, a radius and an ulna. As far as I know, they do, yes. I would imagine that most mammals do, and if they don't, they would have fused together for some reason. I think these chaps do have a radius and an ulna, and they will stretch between the elbow, which is just underneath the, where the belly joins the, the leg, and that, uh, well, what looks like a knee, but is actually the wrist joint. Hmm. Marvelous. Okay, let's go around the corner. Sue, you've got quite a nice theory as to why on earth they should have such wrinkly skin. You say, could it be that they're wrinkled because they need the, mo the extra space for movement that makes it easier for them to move because they are so large? Uh, it's possible, yes, certainly possible. That's a cheetah planes vehicle. They're all watching us, of course, because we're much more interesting than elephants. I've said, I've said this before a hundred times, but when you go into a sighting and it doesn't matter if, it doesn't matter if you're watching wild dogs killing um, hippopotamus, if you drive into a sighting, no matter what action is going on on the ground, the people, other people in the sighting will turn to look at the people coming in. We are completely compulsive people watchers. None of us can seem to help it at all. It's an amazing, amazing trait of humanity, I find. Debbie, you say the elephants are just bored and they are entertained by us. I agree. I actually completely agree with that. I think half the time, elephants enjoy having us around as much as we enjoy having them because it beats the monotony of the endless need to find nutrition to feed such an enormous body. I was reading about birds the other day and it was quite interesting how they spoke about, or the author spoke about the fact that some birds, when they're not breeding, can, own, can get sufficient nutrition in less than sort of 30% of their time. Now, I mean, that's about the same amount of time that a human being takes to eat. And for the elephant, of course, that is completely the opposite. An elephant will spend probably of its waking hours, almost 100% of its waking hours, and of its total time, probably 70 to 80% of its time trying to eat. There is a little impala, and that little impala is born, if I'm not mistaken, of the second rut. And what that means, it was born probably last month. Yeah, it's a small one. And looking very, it's a wonderful Afrikaans word in South Africa, skraal. And skraal means kind of skinny and not particularly healthy looking. Doesn't look too bad, but does look a little bit skinny. Doesn't look quite as plump as the others. And its mum also looks a little bit ropey. And that's just a function of the drought, I think. You'll find they'll start to put it on condition now with the advent of the last rains that we've had. I'm just gonna try and find you that tree that was pushed over because it was not far from where we're currently parked and it was not a small tree that bit it. And I wonder if there isn't a fairly substantial bull elephant in here that is trying to show off his immense prowess. Dave, I'm gonna ask you if you can just, I don't know if you're gonna see it, let me just, um, can you see the elephant through the gap there? I'm gonna sneak forward very slightly. It's just a wonderful shot if you can get it there. Get it now. It's straight through this gap here. There we go. Isn't that cool? Just slip it forward a little bit. There we go. Now that, everyone, is about, what, Dave? About 150 meters away. So about 450 feet, 500 feet. But look at the wonderful picture that forms. And this is the thing with being on foot. You can see them having a bit of conflict there. The thing with being on foot 
is that this kind of view would be perfectly adequate. It's a really wonderful way to watch elephants with them in the distance, and you can watch them safely without them knowing that you're around. And that's the kind of view you'd get. Very nice. Very nice. So, Annie in British Columbia, very nice one. You say you're fascinated by the elephant's foot. Sorry, Dave, is this in your... Your, you see, that's why I put it the other way, you see. Sorry, excuse this. David is, David is being very um, OCD about this little corner of my box. Anyway, we all try and sort it out at some stage. Annie in British Columbia, you want to know about the elephant's foot, and you say you're fascinated by it. I just want to see if... I don't think there's, there is a tree down there, but I'm not sure that's the right one. I think it was probably in here somewhere. We'll keep a lookout. Annie, um, you say, is it like a heel? It is exactly like a heel. It's exactly like the callus that a human being gets on the bottom of their feet if they don't wear shoes. And certainly at the end of a, a December holiday at the beach, I have got elephantine feet. And they then get very soft, of course, once you put shoes and socks on them again. So yes, it's exactly like that. Just remember, though, an elephant's front foot is like a human being's hand. More accurately, a human being's hand is more like an elephant's front foot, um, because, of course, our latest anatomical evolution happened well after the last elephant one did. Anyway, that was a marvelous elephant sighting. I think what we're going to do is probably head across to Arethusa and see if we can't watch see those lions. I haven't seen a Styx lionesses for some time. I've got no doubt in my mind that they will be doing what lions do best, best which is uh, absolutely nothing. They'll be lying on the ground, but it will be worth just saying hello to them, greeting them, and then we'll probably press on and see what else we can find. News on the wireless today, of course, well, actually not very wireless. I went to an, a rangers meeting at Arethusa, which is normally a fairly painful process, because rangers meetings, of course, have had the same agenda for the last 47 years. Radio procedures, when shall we view cubs? Uh, dot driving off-road during the rain, uh, which roads are closed because of the rain. Anyway, so in between uh, trying desperately not to fall asleep, what I did find was that they have absolutely found a den where Shadow is keeping some cubs, so that's exciting. But we definitely won't be viewing them for, I don't think, at least four weeks. But she's found a termite mound on a place called Knobthorn Clearings, and apparently there's such an enormous hole in the termite mound that she actually goes right into it and then sort of sits there with her head out. So, I, I mean, I'd really love to see that, but apparently all is, all is well with Shadow. We don't know how many cubs she has, uh, but certainly she's fine. Karula, apparently, south of us on a place called Little Gauri, she has mercifully moved her cubs away from the public road. Sorry, that was just the area about to be knocked off from the public road that she was on. And so she's also got some privacy, I think, on a... She's, I think she's got a little kill, actually, on a termite mound there. So she's safe, she's fine, her cubs seem to be OK. So all is well with the leopards. So for the next little while, probably a few bit of lean times as far as the female leopards go. Um, but within, a, say, a month or so, we should, with any luck, be viewing lots of little leopard cubs. And of course, that is just a rare pleasure that we will always, always be grateful for. Then other sad news is that Kwatile, who I managed to see only once, and that was largely because I was trespassing by mistake, uh, south of Arethusa, uh, seems to have shaken off this mortal coil. Apparently, Cedric and a few others from Arethusa saw her, and she seemed to have been bitten by a snake. And the very sad thing is that we don't know that she's dead. We're pretty sure she's dead. But um, certainly, it would seem that she had three cubs at the same time. So that's a real sadness. Anyway, that's what happens. That is what happens out here.
Hello, Simon. You want to know about what my uh, other jobs are while I'm at Juma other than presenting. Simon, as far as I can, uh, as far as I can kind of design it, uh, my job at Juma is only to do what I'm doing right now. And that's, I'd say that with slight facetiousness, but I say, say it with some seriousness too. I feel that um, to be on top of me game here, I need to be very fresh to do this job. Um, especially when uh, Jamie's having a rest, you know, as she is now, having broken Wendy somehow. I'm not sure how she managed to do that. Anyway, the big thing is to be able to deliver, uh, I think, a, an experience that is full of energy, and I don't want to be concentrating on anything else. So at Juma, we actually don't have any other jobs. Uh, Jamie and Brent and I, and, um, well, soon to be another fellow, we, that's our main job. Then there's a little bit of admin to do during the day. We might uh, have a camp meeting to find out what things have to be done, a few technical bits and pieces that need to be done, but we actually have nothing to do with the tourism operation at Juma. So there's very little going on with regard to that. Um, then today, for example, we had a chap come in called Renia Mshongo. Now, Renia Tenjana Mshongo is probably the premier tracker in Africa. If, and I mean, I really truly mean this, if not the world. He's been all over the world to teach tracking. He's been to America to teach tracking. He's been all over South Africa. He's been to Australia. Um, where else has he been? I think he's been to bits and pieces of Europe too to teach the art, ancient art of tracking. And he, uh, I knew him down when I was at Londolozi and he runs a thing called the Tracker Academy down there. And he very kindly agreed to come up and spend a few days with us. And that's who, what Brent's doing now. Uh, he's out with Renius, but so the middle of this day, uh, when I wasn't at that soporific meeting, we were walking around with him, and it was just fascinating. He took some of the presenters, and he took the two cameramen, Dave was with us, um, Louise came out too, and he just taught us some amazing things. We did some general basic tracking, uh, which we were rather embarrassed about our incompetence at, um, well, some of us were, and he also taught us lots of other little things, like for example, yesterday I found a tortoise, a serrated hinged tortoise, not serrated hinged, a speaks hinged tortoise, which was covered in mud and he had this kind of root growing out of his face and I thought this was very, very odd until Renius pointed out a hole in a termite mound, which you and I would possibly have thought was just where some termites had been. And it's actually a hole where a speaks hinged tortoise lives. So they go in there, and that's why this tortoise I saw yesterday was covered in mud. That was wonderful. And then he taught me a Shungan name of a, um, a millipede, which is a Shingolongoti. Shingolongoti. Try and say that a few times. And then a little one called Shingolongotana. Shingolongotana. And then what else did we, he taught? He taught us about squirrels and the different alarm calls. And Brent has always said that Renius can speak squirrel. And we heard a squirrel going crazy. Now, whenever we hear a squirrel going crazy, we know there's a predator around, but we don't know what predator, and so we have to go and look. And he said, no, don't worry about it, it's, a, it's an eagle. So we said, well, how on earth do you know it's an eagle? We all look to the sky, said, no, I can't see it, I can hear what the squirrel's saying. And it's, he pointed out a very subtle change in the squirrel's call. It was much longer than it would be for a leopard. So those are the kind of wonderful things that we get to do around here when we're in the middle of the day. And so, Simon, to cut a long and fairly involved story short, uh, the main job that we have is to do exactly what we're doing now and then to try and uh, increase our knowledge so that we can do this job a bit better. Right? The cameramen, on the other hand, have to work a bit harder than we do. They have to do quite a lot of technical fixing and that sort of thing. But of course, once we've got 27 Twitter followers, we tend to think of ourselves as fairly major celebrities. And uh, such things are beneath us. I'm not being serious there, by the way. Now, oh, here is a squirrel calling as we speak. Oh, there. Look, 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 Dad. There's a bird there flying away, and we can hear the squirrel's alarm calling. There it goes. Well, spotted. Well done, Dave. So I stopped here. I heard the squirrel's alarm calling. 
That's the brown snake eagle. And I can also hear some mongoose calling. See the drongo just keeping guard? The drongo will watch him and then bomb him every so often. And that's a brown snake eagle. Beautiful. And Dave, I don't know if you can just pan across these quite unbelievably beautiful clouds. Oops, excuse me. That are gathering to the west. Just stunning. Hmm. Isn't that lovely? I don't know that there's any more rain coming our way, but I just find that inspirational. Now, Gerda and Donna, you want to know the name of the tracker. Renias, R-E-N-I-A-S, Renias, Mtenjana, M-T-H-E-N-J-A-N-A, Mshongo, M-H-L-O-N-G-O, Mshongo, Renias, Mtenjana, Mshongo. And he grew up on Mala Mala. So you know about the reserve called Mala Mala, just south of us. He was born there in a little hut way back, I think, in about 1960. So while the hippies were knocking about Europe and America, Renius was hunting Franklins, digging up roots and herding his father's cattle right around where you and I are looking at this incredible landscape right now. Isn't that a beautiful scene? If anyone could draw and paint, one could uh, recreate that somewhere. Unfortunately, I am the world's most incompetent painter and drawer. Beautiful. OK, let's press on. We're now at the kind of southern boundary of Juma, and we're going to head further to the west now to see if we can pick up on those lions in Arethusa. I'm afraid word on the street seems to be that Wendy is a, in a dire state, so you're stuck with me for the foreseeable future. Ah, now, Joe, that's an interesting question. I think there's quite a lot of debate about it, and I don't know the ins and outs of the debate, but you want to know the difference between, if, if there is a difference, between the Asiatic lion and the African lion. And the answer, Joe, is that it might be a different subspecies, but it's certainly the same species. And what that means is they can easily interbreed with each other. Now, there's some question as to whether the Asiatic lion found in the Gur forest, I think that's how you say it, in India, is in fact an indigenous population. And whether in fact it wasn't a kind of a group of escapees from some kind of zoological expedition. I tend to think that it probably is an indigenous species, certainly because so many, I mean, lions were once the most widely spread mammal in the world. Isn't that amazing? The most widely spread mammal in the whole world was lions. And I think that's an astonishing thing. So I'm pretty sure that the Gur Forest Asiatic lions are exactly that. So I'm just going to get you to listen here. There's the brown snake eagle, same guy. Ah, uh, Gracie, why don't we just listen to the squirrel alarm calling? He seems to have stopped now. Gracie, you say, can that guy, you mean Renias Mtenjana Mshongo, teach you to speak squirrel too? Gracie, he's a wonderful teacher of kids. And so if you ever come out here, we'll try and get you to meet up with Rhenius. And you'll just have to learn his name, you know. You have to say his name exactly correctly, and then he will be able to teach you. Renayas Mdenjana Mklongo. OK. And the difficult bit there, of course, is the which is not a, uh, a sound that occurs in English. It occurs in Welsh and in most of our languages out here, but not in English.
Hello, Janet. Janet, you are wondering if a penguin is a bird. Indeed, a penguin, Janet, is a bird. It is a bird of the sea. Now, if you ever look at a penguin, if you just pick up, may I Google a picture of one? Um, in fact, rather than do that, I'll show you a picture of one, Janet, and I'll show you how you know immediately that it's a bird. I'll just pick a picture in my, in my book here. Here is a penguin. Let's look at the emperor penguin. There is the emperor penguin, Janet. Um, I mean, the, most obviously it has feathers, not hair. Now remember, feathers are completely unlike hair. They are actually modified scales. So they're more closely related to reptiles, birds are, than they are to mammals. And so we know that the penguin has got feathers. Then its wings, there is its wings, which look pretty much like the wings of another bird except they're shortened and modified for swimming. So a penguin flies underwater. And if you ever, if you Google like, um, a, a video of penguins swimming, it looks like they're flying underwater. So they really are very clearly birds, same beaks, obviously, same kinds of feet, webbed feet like a duck. And so a penguin, Janet, is most certainly a bird. That one's found in Antarctica. We don't find them here which is obviously a very long way from here. Too cold for me to go to. I can say fairly comfortably that I don't think I'll go there. Um, well, I might, but I would spend a long time. All right, on we go. Gracie, I hope you can say Renaya Sintenjana Mchongo. Hello, Sunita, in Bangalore, India. I will answer your question if you will answer mine. Um, you want to know, are there any sort of endemic or unique species to this particular area? And I will answer your question. But will you tell me where the Gur Forest in India is? I don't know which state it is in. G-I-R, I think it's Gur or Gur Forest. Where in India is that, Sunita? That would be wonderful if you could tell us, as you are from India. Um, Animals here that are endemic, no, not many that are endemic to only this area. Of course, many that are endemic only to Africa, um, but no mammal is only f found in the low field region here that we don't find somewhere else, so no. And birds as well. I mean, we've got the bird list in the Kruger Park is over, I think it's, what is it, it's about six or seven, yeah, 600 birds that you can find in the Kruger Park. Um, but none of them are endemic. Now, endemic means only found in that particular region. I mean, I suppose the one... The, so, we have the country, we've got the reserve, then we've got the country, and then we've got the region. And the region would be southern Africa, which contains Namibia, um, then Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and South Africa. And I think one of the animals that would be endemic to that area is the springbok, which is the only gazelle that we get in this area. So, springbok... Maybe an oryx. I don't think an oryx is found further up north in East Africa. So an oryx and a springbok are maybe the obvious ones. Nice question, that, Sunny. Just not something I've ever actually thought about. Right, now I'm going to try and get an update on the radio from Arathusa to see where those lions are, A, and B, if we can go and see them. Yeah, this, uh, the road. I seem to be uh, receiving all members. Uh, depending where you're coming from. There we go. Right, now, well, this fellow has very kindly pulled off the road for us. Stand by, everyone. Good afternoon, stations. Arathusa, James here from Wild Earth. Have an update, please, on the sticks location. Great, thanks very much. I'll take second standby. Can you just give me the position? Safari, uh, Donga, North. Okay, copy. Thanks very much. All right, so we've got a, we booked ourselves into that sighting. Uh, we'll go there in a little while. It's actually quite a good thing that we can't go there now. Let things kind of cool down a bit, and then we might be able to spend a decent amount of time with them.
In the meantime, we'll see what else Arethusa has to offer us. I think let's go straight down past the sign and then we'll come up the airstrip from the other side. Hello, Vido, you're in Santa Fe, uh, which is somewhere I've always wanted to visit, believe it or not. Sounds like a nice place to go, Santa Fe. A warm, pleasant climate. Vito, you want to know what woodpeckers we have here? Vito, we have four kinds of woodpeckers here. We have the cardinal woodpecker, which is a little one. I'll show you a picture just now. Let me get off this main road. The cardinal woodpecker, the bearded woodpecker, the golden-tailed woodpecker, and the Bennett's woodpecker. Those are the four that we get here. The Bennett's is most obvious by the fact that it feeds on the ground. The bearded its most obvious feature is that it makes a territorial tapping noise in the mornings. It'll find a, often a hollow knobthorn tree and go ta 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 And you can hear it echoing throughout the bush. It's a wonderful morning sound. The golden-tailed woodpecker has a golden tail, but so do all the others. And so its most notable feature is its call, which is a very nasal whine. It goes, <coughs> which is not very attractive at all. And the cardinal woodpecker, of course, is the smallest of the woodpeckers. And it has a cardinal's cap on the back of its head. But I'll just, I just don't want to miss the turn off here because I have, of late, found myself trespassing by mistake a few times, so I don't want to miss the turn off. Bear with me. And then I will show you a picture of all the woodpeckers that we get here. I think the turn off is over here. And of course, it was well south of this position that I was watching, um, that I was watching Dia Patile before her untimely demise, possibly at the fangs of either a cobra or I suspect more strongly a mamba. What I'm going to do is just open my map because I'm now completely paranoid about, uh, about missing, missing the turn off. Wild Earth traversing, yes, please find me. Oh dear, location not available, that's not good at all. General. No, that's not going to help. I'm getting seriously worried, everyone. I can't find the turn off. Yes, thank you, Jamie. I am going to take the first right. I'm just worried that I haven't passed the first right already. Come on. Oh, goodness. Thank you. Right, great. Jamie says we haven't passed it, everybody. She's watching. And she's keeping out. Oh, there we go. I can see where we are. There, you can see where we are too, everyone. We are that little blue dot, and we can go to the edge of the white bit down there. There we go. We're fine. Whew. There seems to be somebody virtually driving in David's backside, so I'm just going to pull off the road here. patient human being. Anyway, so it goes. <laughs> I find myself in very much the same position as that man, of course, desperate to get to where you need to go. And some chap like me driving along, enjoying the joys of the autumn, the marvelousness of this March afternoon, which of course is fair enough because it's a game reserve not a highway. Ah, thank you, Sunita. So, Sunita, you in Bangalore, and you say that the Gur Forest is in Gujarat. That is the state that it is in, Gujarat. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Now, there are some zebras, but we're going to carry on, I'm afraid. I just want to get off this main road. Um, and you say that it's well known for the lions, so it's obviously relatively easy to see them. That's great news. Thank you for that. It's quite a comfort having a navigator sitting in the final control. If I go off piece, Jamie will no doubt get on the radio, yell at me and tell me to turn around. I 
seemed to need a navigator full time. Right, the turn off should be just over here. easy from the other side there I see it everyone I see it fear not we're not going to be arrested well, I know you're all desperately worried about my being arrested <laughs> uh, hello D in New York uh, you want to know how medical emergencies are dealt with in the bush well D that's an interesting that you should ask that, because uh, last week, two weeks ago, we had a, a medical emergency um, training where we had a scenario. And the scenario was that Scott fell out of a tree and uh, Leanne was mauled by a buffalo and Stefan had both his arms and both his legs removed. Um, history doesn't relate how that happened. Anyway, it all happened and we, we scattered and we ran off to do our various things. And um, look, I mean, didn't, we probably would have been okay. I think Scott, who had fairly severe injuries, would have got to hospital, probably a lot more injured than when he fell out of the tree, but he would have been okay. Uh, Stefan, who was in the form of a, I don't know if you've ever seen those dummies that you learn to do CPR on, um, was just lying in the clearing in the form of a dummy, which was, uh, it was very difficult to take that seriously. And then the Anne was squealing gently underneath a tree where she had apparently hurt her leg. Anyway, uh, we, 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 got, we got through the thing, and it was, uh, it was quite entertaining and very good practice. But in all honesty, in all honesty, oh, isn't that a magnificent sight there? We're just going to move up the southern end of the airstrip here. In all honesty, what happens is in a medical emergency, there are a few things that you can do. We're coming onto the Arethusa airstrip here. If it is something like a heart attack, perhaps, or a stroke where you, and it's the middle of the day, then we will try and get an aeroplane in here and fly you to Nelspreet. Nelspreet's the nearest hospital, two and a half hours away if you really gun it in a car. Um, and if, if you are injured, like you break a leg or something like that, we would stabilize you here, and get a plane in or a chopper, and fly you out. Or if we had to, we could get an, uh, an ambulance. There is a group on site in the Sabi Sands. They are 45 minutes away from us, though. Snake bite, um, something like a, a mumba bite, which is the, the most dangerous, I suppose. Uh, highly unlikely to happen to you, but it is the most dangerous. Um, then you, what you do is you put somebody in a car and drive them as fast as possible to the nearest um, medical facility. And you've got apparently about an hour and a half to two hours. No, I think, I think you've actually got three hours before that person will go into respiratory failure. Now, as long as you can keep breathing for somebody who's been bitten by a mamba, they will eventually work the poison out. So, it, you know, you can survive it. It's not a sort of death sentence. Now, those of you who are keeping bird lists, just have a look at this little thing here. It's a pipit. And a pipit is a... Well, it's possibly one of the most drab birds you'll ever see in your life. But it is interesting in so much as, well, it lives in the grass here and is a good one to have on your list, really. And it is not wagging its tail. That is notable. And I will show you the pipits. There, oh, it is wagging its tail, isn't it? Oh, you can't see it. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> it's right there. You see this kind of moist patch here? It's just in front of the moist patch, and now it's moving to the left. Um, go left from where you are. Left, left, left. Now zoom there. Zoom, zoom, zoom. All the way. There it is. Middle of the... There you got him. Middle of the picture. Well done, everybody. There is the pipit. And it is now wagging its tail. Very difficult to see. That is not David's fault that he didn't see it. It's my fault for not pointing it out properly. So I have to keep listening to the radio, everyone, just to make sure that I don't miss the space there in that lion sighting. So if you do hear it going crackle, crackle, I'm sorry about that. Now we'll find you the pipettes. That particular one is known as the grassfelt pipit. And the way, the only way you can tell that is he's got a bit of kind of marking on his underneath his throat.
and he wags his tail a bit. Other pippet you might find here, buffy pippet, long-billed pippet. And uh, you should say pippet a few times, just because you get the satisfaction of having those two peas coming out of your mouth in quick succession. Pippet, 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 pippet. Right, here are the pictures of the pippets. Um, <laughs> that's the one you were looking at there, it's the grass felt pippet, or African pippet. See, he's an insect eater and he'll run around on the grass trying to catch the odd insect. Then quickly, before um, Dave unzooms there, I'm just going to quickly find the woodpeckers, which are on page 286 of this very fine book. Unfortunately, the author of this book has rec recently shaken off this mortal coil, and so these will not come out again. Uh, there are the four that we get here, very conveniently placed on one page. Vito, there's the cardinal, and so named for that little cardinal's cap, that the male has. They've all got a bit of a cardinal's cap. There is the golden-tailed woodpecker. You can see that they all have golden tails. And there's the bearded, which is a very large one. Uh, it's much bigger than the others, sort of 23 centimeters, so uh, about the length of this book. And there's the bennets. Now, I was reading the other day that apparently the, what are they called again? They're called the Picidae or the Pickidae, yes, that's the family that they belong to. The Pickidae are not very well represented here. They're not anything like the size of the New World woodpeckers, which I think could get up to sort of, that side almost a foot long, probably. Some of the New World or American woodpeckers, which I was quite disappointed to find out. But that is a big woodpecker. I wouldn't want it pecking on me. Gorgeous golden light starting to develop there in the west. And it, Louise, uh, just to keep you posted, what we do is I've taken to sitting after lunch and I read a book called Ornithology for Africa and um, <laughs> I, re I read out a fun fact to the staff as they sit and what I think is quite a fun fact, they've probably just tolerated. Anyway, the one interesting thing we did read about the woodpeckers the other day is that they're what we call zigodactyl, which means they have two front-facing um, digits and two back-facing digits. But uh, that's not uncommon in a bird. Um, parrots can do the same thing, and um, owls are built the same way. But what is unusual in the woodpecker is that it can bring both of those... It can bring the back two round to the front. So it can have all four facing front if it needs to. It probably helps while it's holding on to a branch, bashing its head against it. That was what Louise wanted to know about. That was the fun fact of uh, Wednesday, I think it was. What is this? Just quickly, Dave, that huge stalk-like bird. That's, that's incredible, everyone. Look at that. That is a black stalk. And I'm really just amazed by this because I haven't seen one here for so long. And the reason is that they are cliff-nesting birds. They don't nest in trees. That is very cool. That's probably two birds for many of you who are keeping your lists. The African pipit and the black stork. Seemingly a one-legged black stork, but I suspect actually just standing on one leg. Let me get a bit closer and around the sun, and hopefully it won't fly off. And what that will allow us to do is just get an idea of its colour. Now, watch, just watch it, Dave, if you don't mind. Can you just stick on it? Because I want to see if the leg comes down, the other leg, while we, while we drive up. This is really cool, everyone. This is not a this is not a usual bird to see here. It's got the most wonderful red beak, which you can't see now. But we'll get round the sun, and then you will see it.
Any luck? I'll try and get it without all of the sticks in the way. Nice, Dave. Well done. Good job. OK. Now, you can see its other leg there tucked up. And he's got a very grubby beak because he's obviously had his head buried in the mud here. You see how dirty he is? He hasn't cleaned himself today. Disgusting. Cool. There, he's put his leg down. Well, that's very nice of him. Did you see that, Dave? Yeah. Yes, he just went to the loo. Hmm. Super. Now, that, of course, will not be wasted. That will be eaten by some kind of fish or invertebrate or even one of the terrapins knocking about in this little pan. So, as I say, unusual because they are... I mean, it's not... It's not that astonishing to see them here, but it is unusual. And they are, like I say, cliff-nesting birds. They don't nest in trees like most of the other storks. Here he goes. That's really cool. So size-wise, probably the size of a white stork, which most of you will know. And maybe about, mm, I don't know, about two and a half feet tall. There he goes. Yeah, I also thought he'd fly up and st stop on that dead tree. Cool. Very nice, everyone. Let us know if that was an addition to your bird list. 